process that was opened about a week ago. That application for this appointment seat in January the 4th. On January the 7th, the City Council will whittle that down, we'll have some interviews, and whittle it down to three candidates. That's on the 7th. And on the 9th of January, they will vote on who that individual is that will be selected to fill the seat, and that person will be sworn in on the 10th. So critical dates. Before the application closes, the 7th is when the uh, interviews occur, and it will be whittled down to three. And then on the 9th, and a, a select D. And on the 10th, that individual will be sworn in. Are we clear? Are there any questions we have of the previous year? There being none? OK. Oh, OK. Go ahead. So I know we um, saw a uh, candidates, you know, put candidates on the We don't know. Uh, I, I've asked any, and we've asked any and everybody who was going to participate to announce and to be a part of the process. As you well know, some people make their own choices. Okay? And this is a unique situation, and so those individuals who make their own choice, I'm assuming, decided not to participate in this process. Okay? But I'm sure that we're well aware of what we're doing. As um, retiring councilman Cruz made a commitment to support the recommendation of this entire community. We have not asked the councilman that. Uh, one of the things that the councilman has asked me was if I had anyone or uh, uh, you know knew of some names to be able to make that recommendation. Yeah. Whoever he's asked that to others, I don't know. But we, this this committee has not asked him that question. Well, will this committee ask him that question? Well, since this is a body of the community, once we finish, uh, if indeed that's the will and the wish of the, of the community, we will do so. Very good, Jay Rutherford. Okay. Very good. Any other? How is the notice of the first meeting uh, there, there was no official notice sent down on the first meeting, but there was on the second. The first meeting started with a group of interested individuals who said we need to get involved and engaged. Like most issues start with a small group of people. And that's when that triggered the round two meeting, and here we are today in round three. So that we can be inclusive. And I think all of us agree that one of the critical things we need to do in this one meeting is create a better line of communication so that that net can be broader. And that's one of the things that we hope our, district, our new district two council person will work on. It's a great, you know, I don't see too many young people in here, but we've got some folks in technology, and I've had some conversations with people in technology to really speak to how we can communicate better since we don't have mainstream radio. Okay? So that's a great question. So we're going to officially move into our meeting. Our panelists, we'd like to move them to the table. Um, Sister Gabrielle, please come forward. Liz, where's Liz? Right here. We need to have a table, Liz. Table? Either one. Either one. Okay. Well, well, wait a minute now. I'm serious with questions. We're going to have some time for the questions. If there are questions of clarity, we're going to ask them quick. We're going to answer I'll give this young lady here and then I'll come to you. Well, I'm sorry. That was sent out via uh, the homeowner association network. Yes. Okay. Because I don't have one there. Okay. But we're working on our communication. Jordan, we need you at the table to see that rally. Table. Mr. Tony probably need another chair. Um, so we can have our panelists at the table. Well, they're they're facing this way because they're asking the candidates questions. Both of you standing here and they can ask those questions and look into your big beautiful eyes. Okay. Thank you. It's great. Okay. There was a 
on my candidacy because I will be running that coalition. So I'm sorry, Barbara. Thank you. We we don't want any cheating. So we want to make sure. So with that, our panelists, uh, Margaret, you want to come? And, so Margaret, uh, prepare some questions. Our panelists also will be engaged in question and answers, so you will have an opportunity to engage. But since we have a structured meeting, we want to make sure that everybody is respectful. First off, uh, thank you for everyone coming out here on this Saturday morning. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sir for giving us the opportunity to have this and give sanctuary. A lot of people won't allow this, but thank you, uh, Pastor, and the members of the meeting for allowing us to come and be in here today. Can we have an invitation first? Volunteer, volunteer.
so worried about just jobs, so we're just worried about voting, you know. And whatever issues affect that person, that's important to them, therefore that would be important to me, you know, because I'm here as a servant. You know, I'm here to serve others and not for my personal agenda. I don't have a personal agenda. I just love serving the people. And so therefore, once again, I'm here willing to give of myself and make no sacrifice in my personal life to look out for the people in my district. Because once again, those things that affect them affect me. And so I would like for you all to consider me in this as I consider, you know, even serving the people and being there. For them to tell people, I don't like lighters. If you have issues, bring your issues forth. Let's sit down and focus on the resolution. That's going to affect all. Thank you. Thank you, Brother. Brother Bill, raise your hand so the candidates can go through time. Yeah, I'll say 30 seconds so you know it's all right enough to put some photos on. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor. This church today. God be your God. I want to thank all my friends and family at District 2. I'm a lifelong resident of District 2. My name is Derek Hill. I've served in the Senate for the Fire Department for over 34 years when my public service started. And I recently retired from the Fire Department, but I did not retire from public service. That's why I'm making myself available to you. Having been president of the United Black Firefighters Association, for over 10 years, we've been in the schools and the community doing habitat work. I've seen the faces of your children in school. When I came up as a youngster right here on the east side of San Antonio, we had summer programs and stuff. I'd like to empower them, give them hope for their summers to be economically empowered also, to help their families one day even be recruited in such an organization as I did that has allowed me to make a living for my family. Well, I met my wife for 35 years in Sandwichton High School. Our sons both graduated from Sandwichton High School also, and they make their homes here on this side. This is a proud district. I love being in this district. I serve this district. It would be my duty to continue to serve. You know, it would be an honor for me to represent all of the people in this room whom I've leaned on. I see some of your faces here today who I've had to call on many times. I want to thank you for that person. Good morning, everyone. Can you guys hear me? My name is Leslie Bryant. I was born and raised on the east side. Graduated from San Houston. Left the east side. Moved to Washington, D.C. for about 20 years. Uh, got relocated to Atlanta and moved back here in 2008 to be close to my mom. And those were the best years of my life before she went on to be home with the Lord. Um, but when I came back, I noticed that a lot of things on the inside really didn't change from when I left in 1975. And I really got concerned about that, so I started getting involved in the community. Uh, I was the president of the PTA San Houston. I didn't have a child in the school, and that opened up a lot, a lot of doors along the lines of education, meeting people. Uh, I was the vice chair of the Gear Board. I've been uh, chair on the National Committee for Transportation, um, involved with different city committees and all, but one thing I wanted to express why I'm interested in applying for the vacancy of District 2 is that over the next five to six months, the city of San Antonio will be making major decisions that will have a huge impact on District 2. Those issues are housing, transportation, the firefighters contract, and also the selection of a new city manager. And we're going to need someone in that seat that has the knowledge and experience to have a book to represent District 2 and have a voice because if we do not have a strong voice to represent the district in those discussions, then we're just going to end up getting whatever someone else decides that we should have. So, 
Thank you for your time, and uh, we will be proud to represent the district. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm Chris Dawkins, and uh, would like to give uh, honor to this church, and uh, thank you for everyone for coming out. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say to you, uh, I think it's very important to go through this process as we, we are doing right now. There are many things that are facing District 2 that we're going to have to be really uh, we're just going to have to look at it very importantly. Uh, like Lester said, there's going to be a lot of things that are coming up in District 2. Making sure that we get a city manager, making sure that uh, the development that happens within District 2, there are a lot of things that we have to look at. And I think that the city is going to go through a number of things that District 2 is going to be very important in. We've got developers that want to come in. We've got a new city that I believe is going to be happening as we make District 2 uh, very relevant to the whole city overall. And I think to be able to do that, you're going to have to have somebody that knows about business, that knows about community, that like Rose Hill talked about, we've got to make sure that we bring the community together with all the HOAs and make sure that people have a seat at the table in what it is that we're doing. When I talk about serving, I'm not talking about a person who's going into a seat to give their opinion as to how things should be. I believe that we come together as a community and we decide what we want to do together, and that's how we govern. In America and in the community, we have lost that. Politicians must understand that we serve you, not the other way around. We don't really go in there to give our voice. We go in there to be the voice of the people. So I represent the voice of the people, and I hope that you will consider me. Thank you.
I guess I'm maybe the oldest uh, of the group, uh, 79 years of age, but I have a lot of experience to offer. So I've been in the group for 56 years. I know what the issues are, the drainage, the uh, streets that are poorly uh, constructed, and uh, no uh, storm drainage inlets, you name it. I know all of the issues that we have been faced with. And we always get the short end of the stick. Uh, we are the investors. We are the ones that should be getting some returns for our investment in the city. Uh, we lack so many things, and, and at the top of the list for me is the hospital because I care about the health and well-being of our citizens in District 2. We have a lot of things that need to be done, and I have a lot of experience, and I've done a lot of things in the community, and I'm going to continue to do it. Uh, I want to be uh, able to go ahead and get things done. I don't play games with the politicians. I know how to deal with them, and uh, for the longest time, we had people that would go to college and would have to take remedial classes because they came from the east side, and uh, the same with the west side and the south side when they went to, to college. The north side didn't have to get remedial classes, uh, but I changed that. Uh, so I don't play games. And I pissed a lot of people off. And I don't care. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and be transparent as I've been. And I don't have any nonsense uh, that I tolerate. Thank you. How much time do they have to? A minute and a half. Okay, minute and a half, candidates. Both of you are legislative or regulatory policy priority when you are appointed or elected to serve as our next city council. <coughs> For me, uh, Chris Dawkins, it would be safe. Uh, we've really had too much violence in our area. When you look at the media, it is always a lot of the east side that's going on. And I believe that we can solve that. One thing that Rose talked about, again, with the communities, uh, when I talked to Chief McManus and Alcoy DA The Hood, one of the things that we talked about is being able to do and look at safety. One of the things that they told me about safety is that a lot of the areas that are having problems with the shootings, with the killings, are those areas that don't have neighborhood associations or homeowner associations. Those are the things that I think that if we begin to bring people together, we can begin to look at that. Uh, it's going to be very difficult, but I believe that we can, we can actually do that. But I also want to say something else. That person who was appointed, you only really have five months. So I'm not so sure what can be done in a short period of time. What I'm looking at is a long range plan to be able to look at after the five month period. So within the five month period, I think that first of all, I would look at, at safety. I also look at development in District 2. I think development is very, very important. I think we look at development people within the community as well as people who are outside the community. There are a lot of things that we need in the community, and I think if we begin as a community to look at it together, we can begin to solve some things. Thank you.
I'm back in school. I would definitely go in there and ask for transparency. I want to see the books. I want to see the projects that have been planned for District 2. How many have been achieved? How many have, are in the process of being achieved? We need to know what to be discussed behind closed doors that we're not a part of. <coughs> Talking about communication. We need to know what's happening. We don't have communication, either in English or in Spanish. Sometimes I have to meet with my community and speak and translate for them. That's not my job, but I will do that if I need to, because the city is not being transparent. We know we have CHIP. Are you familiar with CHIP? Some of you don't. Some of you are just taking the head. I've been doing my research. Do you know that you have money available to you right now? They just voted in November, and they went and implemented it in December. But do we have that information? No. I'm doing my homework, and I'm not going to I want to find out what we expect and what we receive from the city. So we need to have that transparency. We need to have that book open. So yes, I'm going to be doing my homework, but I'm going to go in there because I literally love to watch YouTube. We have now cast that records private meetings. You're familiar with that? Go in there and find out those meetings that have been broadcasted that we're not privy to. And we need to know why we're not at that table. That's what I want to do. Thank you.
or make the transition easy for the next person. But right now, we don't want this to be a dead period of five months. So my focus would be to, to get in there, find out what's going on, get on top of it, and make sure those things are followed through. And not just a whole bunch of ideas that are floating in the air and the possibilities of what can happen. As I said, those things that affect you all affect me as well. And I want to see this district that I love. <clears throat> I didn't grow up in this district, but I chose to move in this district, and I recently bought another house, and I chose to stay right where I'm at so that I can be available to serve District 2. People ask me why I need to move somewhere else. I said, no, District 2 is my home, and I want to see us not be pimped out and played, but I want to see us have the benefits that everybody else in the city of San Antonio has. Thank you. Okay, great question. Um, when it comes to policy, um, and we have, and we all know that we have a lot of policy out there. The thing about the city council, the city council is a legislative body. And so when we talk about policy and government, we have to understand that there may be existing policy, but there has been a lack of government, governance or execution on the policy. So like Denise and Doris said, the first priority would be to get would be first to hear what is the number one concern in the community. Is it safety? Um, is it housing? What is it? And then get in there and start to evaluate the policy and see does it need to be governed better, does it need to be executed better? And then if whatever the case is with that policy, then you have to go to work and get the consensus of at least five of the council people to change the policy. The district two person just can't say, okay, we're going to do this. When you're serving on a council or a board, you have to get the consensus of your fellow, uh, your peers. And so that's, that's my solution for that. You have to evaluate, then you have to take action. So that, that's my thought. Again, I'm Derek Kelly from San Antonio Fire Department, recently retired, lifelong resident of the East Side. Just east of us is a corridor of 410 and 35 that has tremendous commerce going back and forth. Yes, safety is the number one priority. We should regulate a lot of the going and coming on 35 and 410. That's hazardous materials. I've been in the safety business. We can see what a problem out there has caused all kinds of detriment on that side of town that we, we never even hear about. We need to regulate some of that big businesses that come in this community and do work and not be held accountable. I think they could all give back. I'm that person that's willing to knock on doors, get opportunities for our young people. And as far as the safety, for in the streets where our young people and, and elderly people can, can operate on a daily basis, we have to empower these people. Economic growth on this side of town systemically will affect some of those issues. I truly believe that good education, economic growth, Systemically, will address some of the safety issues on the streets of San Antonio. That's, that's the only way you can operate with the transparency that's already in place, needs to be executed and enforced. Communication always, by having regular meetings, HOA notifications, of, of getting to you in a timely fashion. You can, you can block out time, come to your neighbors and family and friends and communicate, always. Say that two times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just talking to you. I was going to say it too. <laughs> um, communication 
that has been a big part of my career in communication. One thing I've learned is that communication is not an area where one size fits all. You know, in, in our times today, we have social media, we have some people that are still in the, they feel most comfortable with face-to-face -face communication. And so, from a district two standpoint, communication to the constituents, you have to use all, as I call them, reaching out methods. Because you can't just say, okay, I'm going to post this on social media and everybody's going to get it because everybody's not on social media. You can't say, oh, I'm going to send an email blast because everyone may not be on email. So the town hall meetings, the social media, um, and then also the emails, those are the methods to use. And then sometimes this may sound a bit old fashioned. But sometimes picking up the phone, calling somebody, or being out in the community where people are out and about in their everyday business and just talking to people. You know, we've got to the point in our society where we don't talk to people. You know, we'd rather text. You know, we'd rather send an email. We don't want to look in someone's eyes and talk to them directly. So to be effective in communication, you have to use all those methods at the same time. Thank you. One day I can say is I'm not a politician, I'm a servant. Serving with God, serving other people. Um, I've been a business owner um, seven years. I worked for state rep, um, Ruth Joseph McClendon. And being in those positions, you understand that you're there for the people. And communication is a very valuable thing. One of the things that has to be thorough, direct, and consistent. You know, and because of like what I do now with taxes, people aren't, everybody don't want to go pay for it. And some people still want their tax return and paper and hold it, cut to sign it. And you have to be able to be flexible in all those areas. And the council are going to say, can you all of it? So when you have a staff, you have to make sure the staff understands they're there to serve the people. They can get it paid, you know, and that's their job, but their job is to help you serve the people. And I've experienced that lack of communication. So one thing I've always made sure of is first, I communicate with them, and then I communicate with the people, or I make sure the people get the proper communication. And if it's somebody who's not tech savvy, social media savvy, how do we get the information to them? I want the people to know, hey, first of the month, you know, you're going to get a letter, and it's consistent so they can look forward to it. If there's somebody who needs a call back, we will call them back. And keep track of all that. So communication is very valuable. Thank you, Dr. Chris Dogs. Um, this is an area where I think I would like to think that I excel. What we need is what Rose said, is people to be engaged. We've got to get our community engaged. So the communication for me means making sure HOAs and uh, neighborhood associations are working together. We've got to get those people who are in the neighborhoods to make sure that they're working with each other and working together as a neighborhood. And to do that, I think Rose, when she talked about originally talking about forming a, what I call the community congress, where all the communities get together on a monthly basis so that the ones that are here can understand what's going on with the other ones in other areas. And in that way, you're also able to find out what priorities may be. But I also think this is a two-way conversation because when you have communications with the HOA, you do have some seniors and other people who may not be able to get out to the HOA meetings or may not be able to be engaged in that way. When they're not able to engage in that way, then I believe that that's where uh, Dory talked about calling the office 
you've got to make sure that people who are calling the council office, that they make sure that they can get their questions answered and somebody calls them back. So that communication for me is two ways. And we do need some updates. Easy. We have a calendar on our own uh, cell phones. There needs to be a calendar for District 2. We need to know where the staff is going to be so that the people of this district can go to them. There's no excuse that they can't answer the phone. If they're going to be at a meeting, if they're going to be in a neighborhood, you know they're there. You don't have to go on to that neighborhood. You can still attend. It's an open meeting. Go there, meet with those uh, employees and your representatives from District 2. Now, calendar leads to something else. We also have to incorporate the children of this, of this district. Go to the schools. Go to the district. Uh, uh, actually, school is We have several of them here. So, we need to know what's happening in the home life of these students. Whatever's happening there will affect the home life. If there's issues with their, with their homes, issues with their employment, it will be an effective situation if we can open that dialogue dialogue with the children and the families living in those homes. We have to have dialogue. We have to have communication. I can't read minds. I'm sorry. I'm not a magician. I have to know what every one of you has concerns about. From the youngest to the oldest, to the seniors in housing, seniors that need housing, people that are being moved out, we need to know where the displacement is going to affect them. The city needs to be involved with that. We are Placement. We are creating our own homelessness. So thank you. We just have to have a dialogue. <coughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, well, we need an open door policy. The council uh, person has nine staffers, uh, eight staffers, that uh, are supposed to be out there uh, engaging with the community. Uh, and they shouldn't have to, uh, the residents of District 2 shouldn't have to make an appointment to see you. Uh, you should be available to them all the time, not just when it's convenient for the council person. Uh, you know, this is a full-time job, and you should be uh, there available to the public. And you have to be able to uh, let the public know also what the issues are. It's a two-way street. But the main thing is, when people have concerns, they want you to do something about it. And that's what I have always done with the Eastern Triangle. We uh, meet on a, on a monthly basis. And the neighborhood association leaders uh, have the opportunity to go to those meetings and voice their opinions and their concerns, and we should be able to act on them. So it's important to go ahead and be available uh, to the public, uh, not on uh, your terms, but on their terms. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sister Gabriella, I live here in the east side of the church for the last 30 years. Uh, in terms man, in terms of education, how are you going to work with the schools in the district? When are you going to meet with the principals of the schools?
honored by their uh, uh, our Republic folks. I have been engaged with uh, meeting with them in, in uh, concert with uh, Mr. Howard. So I am very, you know, concerned about what happened in the school. And uh, so I, I know that Sister Carvella has been involved in our community for such a long time with the COP organization and so on. So, uh, you know, this is the thing. We have to address all of the issues of the children, especially because they are our future leaders and it's important to go ahead and, and be able to guide them um, to the right thing. <laughs> Okay, I've met some of these visits, and that's not a problem for me. I tend to walk in, introduce myself, and start asking questions. I want to know what they need. But it's not just the school districts, it's the boys and girls club. That's a huge part of this community. We need to know what happens after school. We need to know what's happening with pre KSA. We need to see if it's effective. What else is needed for that department? I'm lucky enough to know some people that work with that pre-KSA. It's a wonderful opportunity. Maybe it needs to be tweaked. Maybe there's, there's some really great advantages and expand on that. But really what we have to do is not only deal with the paid school district, but those opportunities that we have for the children. If we need more, let's think about it. Let's work with the communities. Let's work with the different areas of town. We have a facility just down the street a beautiful park. It's empty. Why can't we have activities there? Why can't we have sporting events there that include all the quantum schools, idea schools, because it's no longer our pay tax is going into a school district, but we also have quantum schools, boys clubs and girls clubs. So it's an open situation for all the community to get involved. Thank you. Um, my answer to that would be, uh, I would love to get involved with the schools. But unfortunately, the city council does not really get involved with schools. What we can do is maybe have some influences as what happens with schools. Um, we have 170,000 people in District 2. And we have 29% have high school education. We have 21.9% have less than a high school education. These are the things that I think that I can take to James Howard, that I can take to the school system and say, how can the city help you? How can we begin to put programs in District 2 to be able to help that? Because we cannot track businesses if we don't have people who are educated. So my short answer again is, city council really doesn't get involved in schools, but we can do things to support the school system. Thank you. Um, once again, my name is Tori Brown, and I may have just come in. And as a parent of an elementary student, I've dealt with um, private school, charter school, and now uh, a public school. And if there's any way that the city council position can be an avenue of communication and connecting resources to help the schools, that's something I would look, look to. We have several districts, so if we need to reach out to the board first, bring the board and the principals together, you know, have a collaborative workshop of what the city can offer and what the state resources are, we can do that. Um, we're actually having a meeting with the uh, board, we're having a board meeting in Central next week about um, the staffs being armed. Um, we're telling our time may have come for some of that. But we have to make sure we have our focus on education, safety, and whatever resources may be out there. I've seen the quality coming from a private school going to a public school, and it was rather disappointing, even to the point of how the teachers relate to the students. And so I would try to gel that because that's their foundation of who they are. Okay, one minute o'clock. My name is Dr. Celeste Fry, and one day I'm there when I was at the PTA Sandwich, and also 
chair of the ASA 2020 Commission on Education is that what the challenge that we have with education is that we operate in silos. You know, we have 17 school districts, then even within the districts, everyone has their own little territory and people are very sensitive about collaboration. And one thing I've always talked about is that we need to put aside these differences in territory and just think about one thing. What's best for our kids and their education? And then from there, we just make it work. And the city council person, as Chris said, is, doesn't have influence over them. However, they can lead the discussion and bring the people together. Thank you. Again, I'm Gary Killian, president of the United Black Firefighters Association. And one of the first things we did is address the need for scholarship. This is one thing, uh, we've gotten into six different schools within the city, uh, District 2, where we're mentoring to over eight different young men's groups. We'd like to expand that to young women also. This is somewhere you can make a difference. Being in their daily lives in school, getting, getting uh, the problems early that they're facing, because again, you can't wait. This is what we stress to young people all the time. The education is important enough that you should even leave as a senior already having a freshman college education. Save your parents a year's worth of tuition and fees in that regard. Again, we have big business operating in our district. An industrial court just east of us. They have to be held accountable. We need more internships, exposures to our young people. Everybody want to go to college. They can start work. They can make a career, a good career in some of these businesses that are operating in our districts. Good morning, Jordan. Um, so, if you could please um, tell us what experience or tools and successes you've had in bringing development to the community, um, both uh, commercial and housing. Uh, Joy, I think that uh, within the Eastern Triangle, we have been addressing that problem, uh, and we have uh, reached out to the community uh, in a number of ways, and uh, so it's important that we continue to do that. Uh, but we have to be able to be engaged and, and not just talk. You know, there's so much talk and no action, and that's the thing that uh, I have been uh, tired of. The people voicing their concerns and, and uh, not doing anything. Uh, I want to see some action, and, and that's what I'm about. I, I'm not looking to build a political career or anything like that. Uh, my life is uh, coming towards an end, and I want to be able to continue to make a difference, and that's important to me. Thank you for the question. Okay, we're talking about investment, financially, are you referring to, or commercial and housing? And housing. Well, have quite a bit. Um, I'm not a developer, I'm an investor. I'm an investor in my neighborhood. Uh, 30 years ago, my husband invested in buying some homes that nobody ever wanted. They spent them up on the weekend after work. Found local tradespeople, gave them jobs. We work with the plumbers, we work with the electricians. We want to keep the jobs here. That's the investment. We work with the community. Get those homes fixed, we run it. Some we actually sold to our neighbors right now. Some of our tenants, we help them get homes within our neighborhood. That's the investment. That's the personal investment in our neighborhood. We help our families, we help our neighbors, and we help the other people who have a small business get better and larger and keep the growth. And keep, the, keep the family going. That's the legacy. So I'm not a developer, I'm not one of those who are getting all the incentives from the city. I'm that small investor with a bigger dream for our neighborhood. Thank you. Um, I've been involved in uh, being with a CDC, Community Development Corporation, 
not here in San Antonio, haven't done much with housing here in San Antonio. But what I do want to say about housing in San Antonio is that as communities, we know that housing in San Antonio, there is not enough. And there's going to be a lot of low to moderate income housing being put in every neighborhood in San Antonio. So all of us, especially communities, have to get involved because those communities who are not involved, they're bringing low to moderate income housing to your neighborhood. As it relates to commercial development, I was president of Lake and currently still president of Lakeside Neighborhood Association. We had what we call the big meeting. There are several of you in here who were at the big meeting. We had about 300 people at that meeting. We brought Quick Trip, who is on 87, who bring the lowest gas prices to San Antonio. We also have HEV, who's coming to the community. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a lot more that I'd like to tell you. Try my version of it all. Make it quick. I'm not having been a part of actually bringing in development. As a previous business owner of a county business, I took to have my business here in District 2 and employ people within this district. Um, and looking for a place to, to have my office, I saw that coming from the west side and the west side to here, you didn't have as many options. And that's always concerned me because people have to have the resources of having their location, have their offices that, you know, are are nice and we feel safe. I mean, every time I was in my office till 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, you know? And so therefore, you want to make sure you have those and they're not limited and they're not, I mean, I had somebody come to my office and say, oh, I didn't really have anything this nice over here. I was in the, um, and it was a conservative building at the time, and I was like, what do you mean? Just because it's the east side doesn't mean that we don't have nice things. And that's always been a concern of mine and being in that position, that would be something that I would make sure comes here because we do have things to offer in this district. Um, let's run again. I was part of the planning group for the east side promise zone. There was a group of us that worked very hard to submit the planning grant for the Eastside Promise neighborhood. And then when we San Antonio received the grant, then I was part of that committee to also implement the process of it. So that's your commercial development in Hollywood. Gary, give me a microphone, resident of District 2. Again, uh, one of the first things as a member of the United Black Firefighters Association, we got involved in Habitat and Humanity, and that was one way that we could make a difference. Uh, it started out with just an annual march up and down the MLK with the help clean up and restore, and that was a short term fix, but we took it even further and continued to do this year out. Then we expanded on that and saw a way to expose our young men to a way to have the working skills that they can use anywhere in life, wherever they uh, choose to set up for themselves. We could help with Dr. D out of the San Francisco High School and we're hoping to expose some young men to the skills necessary to one day build their own homes, have their own dream house. Uh, all that I have my own, I can lean on a lot of my United Black Firefighter brothers, some will hit the Navy, and again, the schools that we're in, giving us access to make a difference in some young lives. Uh, thank you for uh, coming together because really, if all of you serve, we got good, we got good team, right? <laughs> so, having said that, uh, I've heard some things regarding influence. I've heard some things about evaluating. I've heard some things about five months. You need to be smart getting in the door. On Wednesday, one of you is going to be a community consensus if we come to that today. So, having said that, let's talk about economic development in regards to how transportation fits into that. All right? And uh, basically, I'm going to give you a little quick scenario. 
What's your question? No, I'm getting to that, sir. No, just a question. question. All right. So, all right. So, my nephew came to live with me. He has no car. He can get a job. He gets a job in a blue collar industry up on Ritterman, which is a better paying job than over here. Two buses. Job starts at 6 o'clock. He has the last What's the question? Please do not interrupt me again. James, give me a minute. I said, <laughs> okay. All right, people, come on now. We have to go with scenario driven questions. It's a complicated job. Okay, job starts at 6 o'clock. First bus doesn't get in there till 6.15. She gives him latitude and then pulls it back. He's got to be there at 6 o'clock. Tell me, council person, how you would engage that employer to recognize that until we get adequate public transportation, that kid needs to be 15 minutes late to be on time. Work with me on that. Thank you, David. That is kind of like a three, uh, you know, three of situations because uh, we do need to be able to provide transportation for those working people who don't have vehicles, who can't afford the insurance that goes with it. And so uh, they do need transportation. And, uh, uh, I can't afford Uber to go ahead and provide that. So uh, it's important that uh, we work with the uh, uh, transportation industry, the uh, trains and so on, uh, to be able to go ahead and, and uh, work out a, uh, the area where people need the transportation the most. And so uh, in the past, I have proposed uh, to the transit board uh, and to uh, uh, the Alamo uh, plan uh, to go ahead and consider subway systems. Uh, and uh, they indicated that uh, uh, time, time. Okay. one minute time. I have a question. Um, it's amazing because I went to a meeting recently and via, uh, one of the VIA directors from their department was in tennis. He had taken me a bus. He drove that. Oh. So what I would like to see is the department via we're paying for actually have a department that will have their representatives get on their own via bus and take those routes where we know there's a necessity to transport, provide transportation to the workers of the city, the students of the city who also take me in. So we need to have a special group of via bus to go ahead and take those routes, see whether they're deficient, go ahead and do a better market system because we are going to need it. But they need to go and walk and just start talking. They need to take that via bus and see what everybody else needs from that department. That's all I can say right now. Thank you. Liz, we have a complicated question. Um, I don't really have an answer for it right now, but I will tell you this. I have been working on transportation. Um, since I only have a few minutes, I've been working on transportation for seniors. Um, I sit on the Joint Commission, Bear County, City of San Antonio, and I have two of my commissioners here, Barbara and Betty, if you would stand and just wave your hand. These are two of my commissioners that serve. You can give them a round of applause for serving. Uh, we've been working on transportation, whether it means bringing in Uber, we're looking at Oregon and how they begin to transport their people. We're looking at different ways that we can do that. So we are addressing your questions, but I don't have an answer for you right now. Thank you for your scenario. And I think the main question is how we engage with that company about the person's time. Um, I took the via bus back when I was in high school. I've taken it at other times. I've been in other cities, and I think San Antonio, compared to other cities and DC and stuff, has a great um, public transportation system when it comes to the bus and comfort and Wi Fi and all that stuff. And one of the things that is we engage with that employer directly that you have a person who wants to work, 
who's doing their best to get there in a timely manner, and it's no, there should be a little way to adjust their schedule, whether they cut their lunch short, or they stay 15 minutes later, you know, but in a time when we want people to have jobs and be there so that they can provide for their family, I don't think that's too hard to ask of that employer and make they have a set group where they can have some staggered time schedules. And I don't think that would be too much to ask and talk to them and encourage other companies to do that as well. Because of the bus system, which is beyond their control, but it's there and they're taking it. Great question, Liz. Um, having served on the Media Board and the National Board, transportation is a very, it's not complex, but they, uh, transit authorities use formulas to decide how they're going to have their routes and the frequency of their routes. I know that VIA and Connect SA right now are working on a plan to make transportation better here in the city. But the one thing I noticed when I was on the VIA board, and I'm just going to keep it real, is that when VIA puts out a notice for community meetings to get community input, very few people show up. So if you don't show up, and you have a challenge, then you can't say anything about it. Because if you didn't show up like you did is to voice the opinion. And authorities need the input because every transit authority in the country gets money from the federal government based on ridership. That is a great question. And it's a good problem to have, having a job. I think, I think once you have a job, you can work from there. Uh, it does come from my brand. I think it's just something that can be improved upon. Maybe it sounds like an individual problem that he's had, but I'm sure it's a problem that a lot of people, a lot of people that may have the same issue. And something could be worked out there. And I was thinking more in the way of him being a contemporary worker, he could approach an employer and see about staying 15 minutes long, an issue that he could work out if he's there 15 minutes late, stay 15 minutes long, work through lunch. I mean, I've known people that have had to go to work, catch two, three modes of transportation. These are people that paved the way for me. So, again, I look at that as having a good problem to solve. listening to some of the questions and answers. Uh, my question is, how do you plan to involve the residents in the decision making concerning District 2? You know, a lot of decisions are made and many of the residents feel left out because they don't get the correspondence or they get it after the fact. So how do you plan to involve the, the residents in the decision making? Yeah, we 
they need to be comfortable asking everything. Well, we, we should be able to answer any questions that come up. I'm going to make sure that we are not going to ask questions across the board and I will ask the same question. That would be the last question. Would you like us to continue with the same question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, yeah, we should have dialogue. Um, well, can you repeat the question again? Sorry. How are you going to engage the community of your office? No. In decision-making. In decision-making? Do you like that? Okay, decision-making. Well, actually what we have to go ahead is make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, that's where the neighbors <coughs> need to be able to communicate with their residents. Not how close we to their neighborhoods. We have issues like that throughout our district. We have to make sure that our neighborhood associations haven't been infiltrated by developers. We want to hear from the real resident. We want to hear from the homeowner, the tenant. So we need to make sure that dialogue from them is going to get to the office, to get to the staff. So if we need to have a special meeting, we can have one get with Zoe and make sure Mr. Head is there and not wait months before we actually speak to him and the district regarding an amendment that's going to be going to the HDRC or to Zoe. We need to have that communication because if you don't want something happening in your neighborhood, you need to be able to voice that to your district office before that vote happens. Because now we're going to become commissioners that will vote first, and then it will be city council. So we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Thank you. Um, I think that we have a organization like this and that you've got community organizations. Those community organizations, whatever issue comes up to council, if you have time, you can take it to the community, see how the community finds. The person who's sitting in the seat is actually supposed to be serving for the community. If you're serving for the community, then you find out what the community wants. That's how you're going to affect the decision making. If that person takes that information from the community, then that is the community making the decision. Well, I think step one um, would be to reach out to all the communities. Probably the best way, kind of old-fashioned way, is maybe do it like a simple mail-out, a postcard, or pay postage to all the residents in the district. Have them fill out, how do you want me to communicate with you? Would you prefer mail? Would you prefer a newsletter? Would you prefer social media? You know, and give them the option of saying, your four ways of connecting to the people. Are you part of an HOA? And then as you read down, get that information back, then you can kind of say, okay, these people, because they're older, they want stuff mailed out. They want a newsletter mailed out. Or they want a survey mailed out to them that's prepaid postage that they can easily fill out and mail back. Because you want to hear from them. So you're going to have to make it simple for some people. If those people are more tech savvy, if they'll respond to a text or something, you can put that up there and send out that text blast or email blast that has a way to respond by survey. But first you've got to do something really basic and simple that connects to all people. And if they don't send it back, you know, you've done your part to try to connect to them as well. Great question. Uh, the decision, in regards to decision making for the district, I believe that the residents of the district have to, and along with the city council person, first is to have a strategy. We need to have a strategy for the district. What is District 2 going to look like five years from now, ten years from now? And then start implementing that strategy because the Residents, the uh, homeowners associations, and everyone is in sync together and along with the council person. And this allows the council person to start implementing policy changes or new programs for to execute that vision for District 2. Because if there's a vision and everyone has participated and shared that vision, then that's your decision making process. Again, Derek Killian, lifelong resident, and 
Being a lifelong resident, you should already have an idea of what affects your friends and neighbors and also affects you. So with those thoughts, you lean on the very people that have already had people at meetings, HOA, these are wonderful people that you can go to to get the, the sentiments of all of your friends and family and neighbors. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. These thoughts have already been out there. You have to engage and keep an open door policy, as we said earlier. Welcome their ideas. Be about that all the time. These are the very people that are sending you back to time to be a voice for them. Pete Tony, uh, again, these are from the, from the audience of one video. District 2 has a challenge with how funds are distributed by SAGE. That said, what type of abatement can you campaign for? Would you campaign for in support of business, small businesses, uh, specifically black businesses, i.e. grants, tax abatement for the first three years, etc.? Let me repeat it. Good question. It is a good question. Uh, first of all, the council person has to remember who they're representing. And they're representing the uh, residents and the voters of his district or her district. And so it's important that we go ahead and not have favoritism to uh, a business that uh, uh, may want an abatement. What about the uh, homeowners? You know, they're having to pick up the slack. And so it's important that you remember who you're representing and make a, a, a fair and, and uh, decision when you vote uh, uh, in support of whatever uh, the, uh, the problem is. You know, we have to be able to solve the problem equitably. And so, uh, that's the way I look at the, you know. Uh, when I spoke at the beginning, I mentioned incubators. Um, incubators are extremely important right now. We have one in the West Side called Myosu Central, and it's an incubator for startups. People, individuals who just want to start with their idea, learn the basics, learn how to work with bookkeeping, learn how to network, learn how to use the internet, Get out there, get your name on how to go out there and get a bid with the government, a bid with the city. We need to be there in the east side. We have SAGE, but it can go beyond SAGE. It doesn't have to be just down the North uh, New Rockets area. It needs to expand. And an incubator is going to create this wonderful results if we look at it the correct way. Use what we have, use the knowledge that we have, use the current <coughs> business owners right now and see what they want. What type of people, what type of businesses do we want to encourage to come to the east side? Not just HEB, not just Amazon. We have a whole area on the east side that's ready for development. And that's all we have to look for. Thank you very much. Great question, Keith. Uh, you may not have my answer, though. Uh, I think the sage needs to be changed completely. Uh, I haven't been satisfied with the work the sage has been doing. Just to give the side grants uh, is not what I see a CDC for our, our area to be doing. We need a development corporation. We need somebody that's going to help do planning. We're going to need somebody who's going to help to also assist with MLK. Make our Juneteenth March not a, and I hate to say this, uh, a small thing, but we are a tourist city. We need to do more. I expect more of SAGE. If I'm your council person, SAGE will change. SAGE is going to expand. There's going to be a new type of SAGE. Uh, well, the previous business owner, I think there's always room for improvement and open ideas. Uh, one of the things, uh, I was always going to be like hard on business owners, that you need to come with your A-game. Just saying that you're a president of a company, you got this, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. I want to see what you're doing and how your business is giving back in the process of you offering a business and that you're offering something 
that shows our young people that you can step up and be truly successful. And it's not just a side hustle that you have going on. And so that um, we need to kind of reach back to our young people, our teenagers, our high school. As a former member of the National Association of Women Business Owners, we have a program that taught young girls to think about having a business of their own. Um, this is the name of the program, about writing a business plan. And see that they can see other women business owners and they can have a focus of, hey, I can leave high school and go to college and focus on business. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll have to be the, the bad guy here. Um, and my different roles around the city and working in the community, the one constant that I've noticed, and, and I'm just going to be honest, there are a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of grant money. There's a lot of city and county opportunities. And I think you also mentioned specifically for black businesses. The reality, and even with SAGE, is that SAGE is set up for all businesses on the east side, not just specifically black, specifically black businesses. But here's the other thing, and I've reviewed some applications and other roles is that when we go to the table, we need to ensure that we have dotted our eyes, we cross our cheeks, because it's not about a black, white thing. We have to tell ourselves that to stop having the entitlement mentality that just because we're black, we show up, we're going to get the money. We have to do the same thing that everybody else does to get the money. Thank you. Derek, uh, competition is, is healthy. We need more than one business model. It may have been said once before, but I can't say that enough. Stress on that. We need more than one economic plan for District 2. We start in a whole lot of way. We're behind our districts, neighboring districts 3 and 10, they're prospering and doing well. We need to catch up. We have a learning curve. We need more than one business model. We need to encourage a lot of business. We have people doing business who aren't being held accountable. I can't stress that enough. We got to knock on those doors, engage them, get our young people thinking earlier than they're seeing here in school about being entrepreneurs. Okay, this one is from the audience. If not chosen by the community as a viable candidate, will you actively support the decision of this community body? One minute response. Yeah, I'm part of the community, so I definitely would. Yeah. I think all these people up here show um, the, the yearning to the desire to want to serve this community and I was Okay, yes. I this understand the question. We, we, we assume you're going to support the community because you're right. But will you actively support if you're not chosen? Yes. Yes. That's strength in numbers, so yes, I will support that. Decision making from the from the community. 
Now, specifically, New Braunfels, there's a project coming there. We had several meetings where we asked for our input. We gave them our input, and the city came back and did what they wanted. Nothing that we decided. So within that five months, what will you do to help us make sure that we get what we want on New Braunfels? Okay. Well, I know that there's been a lot of decisions that have been wrong for not only our city, but our district. And I will go ahead and look into it to where I can overturn that decision uh, by uh, providing the information that people don't have uh, and where the money is coming from. There's money that's being hidden away. They can come up with a million and a half to go ahead and represent a, a, a legal uh, uh, fight against the, the firefighters, and they can come up with $38 million to, for the Alamo, uh, the reimagining of the Alamo. There's something wrong. Where is the money coming from? And it's not budgeted, so where did it come from? So, you know there's a lot of money hidden away that uh, is... Thank you. That's not the answer. Well, I know the question... Okay. Well, I'm a neighbor. I'm a neighbor. I'm a neighbor. And I follow your website. I follow the conversation on Facebook and seeing what's happening. You have to follow each other. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to know where did it break down? Were you ever in a conversation? They say one thing. They do something behind the back door. And we need to make sure that we're going to keep everybody accountable. We know what's happening with the things that we We have to wait and see what the Supreme Court is going to do. This is our home. We need to have a conversation. Not just a conversation. We need to demand that they listen to us. And work with the other districts because they vote as well. And they need to vote along the lines with us. Thank you. The, the, the most important thing to me to, to answer your question is I know that Dignity Way Hill is engaged. I'm looking for communities that are engaged. If you're engaged and you've already said that you are against whatever it is that they're doing, with every fiber in my body, I will go there and support you. I'm there to support you. If you are not with it, the association, Dignity Way Hill, I will not support it, and with everything that I do, I will try to stop it. I would say, I'm chiming on that and talk about communication and asking you what you need and what you want. We're here to serve you. And if there's some reason that we cannot do that at that time, I will come back and tell you this is where it's at, this is where it stands, how we need to fix it correctly, and not just leave you hanging on, they hear me. Because you know, I wouldn't want to be treated like that, and I wouldn't treat anybody else like that. So I would come back to you and say, hey, this is the real realization of what's really going on. And the great question, and you are correct, but uh, what I know about that project is that it did just kind of fall flat, and the neighborhood was not kept abreast of what was going on. So, one of my first things if I'm appointed will be to bring that issue back up and find out exactly what the status is and why you guys are back up in the Also, again, a strong beginning to any idea is the best way to have a good finish. And in the beginning of that summer committee is formed, you have to have someone at the table at all times. It can't be meetings without you. Not your voice, someone to represent you. So with that being said, you have to stay engaged, have somebody at the table speaking for you at all times before it even goes forward. I have a question. Uh, my name is Brooke City and I'm the person of the Small Association. How are you planning to get a goal with associations? And the reason I ask that question is because sometimes we need to be the voice of the residents. Some of the residents don't have social media. Some of the, some of the residents don't check email or don't even have email or don't know how to type email. So how you planning to get involved with the homeowners association? Sometimes you have to be the voice of the community. We have to share calendars. The calendar is very important. Any information, any meetings, any events forthcoming, 
If they're on the cabinet, that cabinet needs to be checked daily, twice a day, whatever it takes to be engaged in lockout time and show up. Be accountable. Accountability, communication, all these are important. Well, I understand what you're, what you're uh, asking, and you have to, like I said before, you have to be able to be open, you have to be able to be available, and you can go to talk to those individuals uh, face to face and see what their situation is like. Uh, sometimes code enforcement will write up a uh, uh, property owner for any little minor situation. You have to be able to stand up uh, to that issue and go ahead and uh, let the uh, state the code compliance uh, officer know these are the, the rules, these are the facts, and you wrote up a, 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 a violation that was not justified. Things like that, you have to be able to address that on. Well, it's not just communication with the individual uh, neighborhood associations, but I really want to have the associations communicating with their state officers. We need to make sure that our state officers also represent you correctly and communicate with the district. We need to know what's happening. There are people on the street, and they're not on the street. We need to get more of them out there. We need to make sure they have a presence. So that's the communication. We need to have that old situation where you have an officer that knows the neighborhood, they recognize them, they can stop them at the corner, ask them questions. Those are the questions you want to hear. And that's what I want to hear as well. Yeah. Ma'am, what's the name of your association again? Coliseum Oaks. Are you registered with the city? Yes. Okay. Then hopefully as things go forward, you'll be registered with Liz and those organizations will be meeting. Uh, of course, if I'm your council person, we will be communicating with that group that will be meeting all the time. Thank you. Um, as I said earlier, we would, I would want to get with um, the residents on how they want the information to be um, distributed to them and how they want to be engaged with. So if it has to be in writing, if, if there are not emails out there, whatever, then we will address that as, as that. You know, we can do our best to, make, to get that to them, but we also need them to respond back. You know, and if it takes me coming to you saying, I tried to read this person, you know, if they had an issue um, and they haven't replied back, then I may have to, you know, come to you to make sure that that person's issues are addressed. So whatever it takes to be in the staff, we will make sure that they're addressed. Thank you for the question. Uh, Derek said, you know, it's important to stick up the calendars, but I can tell you that I believe in being engaged, and what I would work on doing is that make sure that either me or a member of my staff is at, attends all the homeowners' meetings, you know, within reason. If there's a conflict, you can't be in two places at one time. But I think that that's the effective way to stay connected, as well as have bi-monthly town hall meetings and bring everyone in so that we can have dialogue like this. And I think that's very good. Thank you. Uh, the Liz
the city take steps to bring in experts, and they oftentimes they see things that we don't see. So, in the case of those hard decisions, when the community is not in agreement, but you see it as best for the community, how do you work with it? Okay, so comprehensive question. How are you going to work with your colleagues to get things done? How are you going to work with your colleagues to get things done regardless of what the issue is? Does that incorporate what you want? Oh, okay. the, that's a perception the city's been dead, that's what you said? Well, well let's, let's say this. How can we change the perception? Are you okay with that? How can we change the perception that the east side is the dumping ground? <laughs> okay? And how will you engage your colleagues to make this happen? Okay. The consensus of the response time is a minute and a half. Who would we like to do a strategic step by step? Uh, really, really quick. I <laughs> just another question. I grew up with a belt hanging on the wall in the living room. So I got lots of movements. I have one hanging in my house, so I'm not a criminal in any way. Uh, I have no problem standing up. As I said earlier, I'm a servant. I'm elected by a point by the people of District 2 to serve District 2. And I believe that District 2 has been taken advantage of in a lot of ways. And that time needs to end. That's one reason that I've got into this. Um, knowledge is power. And as he talked about having the experts come in, that's one of the things that we need. And then we need to take that information back to the people, to the concerns of why things may and may not be getting done and um, what needs to be addressed for those changes. Because we all have a desire to see things change. We need to know what the steps are to make those happen. But coming in in this short period, we need to see what's already going on and what we can do to achieve those things that are in progress that may be at stalemate. Uh, first, the part about working with your colleagues and building consensus. The one thing that I've learned over the years about being on boards is that when you want something and your colleagues have to support you, is that you have to listen also to their needs. It's a two way street because you need their vote. If you don't get their vote, you can't accomplish what you want to accomplish. So you have to listen, and what you're listening for is that you're listening for common ground. Maybe there's something you want, want to accomplish that they have also um, in their support. Secondly, on the strategy, you have to develop a, you have to work with the community, um, and the community has to be engaged. And one of the challenges sometimes is that people can recognize problems all day long and twice on Sunday. But when I manage people, I would always tell them, if you recognize a problem, no, we can work with that. But also, come to me with the problem and the solution. Because if you can identify a problem, you can identify a solution because you know what's wrong. And so as your council person, this is me the ammunition. Because one thing about it, you can't go into a, a gunfight with a knife, and that's what happens so often. Gary Kelly. I, I am not a lifelong politician. Not going to aspire to be somewhere else, so I don't have feelings that I don't mind hurting. The biggest voice heard of the senators of the East Side residents. District 2 residents, just like I said before, District 3, District 10, all around us are prospering. There should be no negotiation. Am I right in saying this is the last place of development? We haven't been developed to, to the needs of the citizens that want quality of life. These are basic safety issues. Quality of life right here. There's no negotiating for the future of District 2. Thank you. Well, I, I believe in 
knowing the issues that the other council people had. And uh, you have to be able to go ahead and recognize their issues as well as let them know what your issues are. So you have to build up consensus between them. Years ago, there was uh, referred to uh, six councilmen as a gang of six. Well, you know, it's because they all have needs in their districts. And so you have to be able to go ahead and be able to work with them. And I have worked with John Courage when I was on that council, uh, college district board of trustees. And you have to build up uh, and be able to provide uh, the uh, substance behind your issues to them and, and vice versa. So that's the way you build the consensus and you can rely on their vote to support you and, and you support them. Okay. Guys, we're in a different game now. Do your research, look at your taxes. They want the something. Their taxes is out of here. We hold cards. So we have to demand and expect them to give us something for what we're paying for in our taxes. It's actually been proven and showing the documentation that we're paying two, three times more than the north side. We have more value here. We expect more in return. And that's what I expect. I've dealt with the commissions, I've dealt with city council, I've dealt with She's actually had a meeting with my group in private chambers to find out why we are upset. We're upset because we're not getting heard. We're upset because we're being overtaxed and not getting anything for it. So yes, we do have the power. They know me. I might not get that interview because they do know me. But I expect to at least have an opportunity to make my voice heard at that interview. And that's all I'm expecting. And that's all I'm hoping to represent me. Different and our future. Pastor Jones, I think you were asking about what happens when there is something comes up that you cannot ask the community. And I'm hoping that the community at sometimes understands that decisions have to be made. And you try to make the best decision in the interest of the community. All the time, you, when you talk about working on consensus, partner, you have to make, you know, you have to make uh, compromises with your other people to, in order to get it. We may not get everything that we want, but we're going to get what we ask for. And next time, we may be able to get a little bit more. So sometimes you may not get all that you want. And that's what I hope with building a consensus with all of the community, we can understand. You can understand how I vote, and I can understand what you want. I want to listen to you to find out what it is that you want and be able to articulate that to the council. We will come back with some of the things that we need. We may not come back with everything we want. May I make a point of personal privilege? I've got to go to a clinic for dialysis, and I do want to make one statement and be very brief. Uh, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, I want to give honor to Keith Tony and Tyler Lutton. So, welcome to this community. And this man should be the city councilman, but he has a real wife. And he makes that his priority. The second thing I want to say is, I hope that all of you consider, when you make your recommendation, that you consider a person who has, for 40 years, given their life, their blood, and their soul to this community. And that's Tommy T.C. Callaway. I'd like to formally put his name on this list. He's interviewed for 40 years. I have all the respect in the world for these six people here. 
The Tongue Teaching Chapel and his cohorts are responsible for the Barbara Dunn Community Center. Thank you, sir. And I want to make that announcement. Thank you. This was a community question, actually, in several constituents outside, including outside. The bottom line is, city council will vote on climate plan next April. Okay? And they're appointing someone to D2, but before the May 2019. That means whoever is appointed, even if they lose in May, will get to approve or deny the proposed climate change. Let's elevate ourselves. How do we feel about that? That's one of those things I address that when we get in there, we have to see what's going on, quickly doing our homework, and try to find what, what the district feels. It may be a decision where we have to listen to the experts and come in and make the best decision that's going to affect us individually as a resident of District 2, because that decision is going to affect me. I'm not going anywhere. There's no question on that. Uh, the federal government has already put San Antonio on notice. Our emission rates are starting to go out the road. I would vote yes for the climate, okay? And I would expect all of the council members to vote in favor of that. That should be unanimous. research on this because simple vote will have repercussions for the community. How many here can afford an electric car? How many stations are we going to need around the city to create those charging areas for those electric cars? There's a lot involved with climate change. Yes, we understand we have to have a inner city, but we also have a financial responsibility for our community. We can't put those type of ramifications in somebody's budget. They have to be able to get around. They have to be able to get right. to their appointments. Thank you. Well, I'm a, a great supporter of climate change uh, um, because we we do cause climate change uh, to affect our well-being. And so, uh, absolutely, you know, I am a public supporter, and I'm sure other council people recognize that uh, as being a major problem. Open ditches that we have that uh, have stagnant water and all of that, you know, is in our district. And so we have to be able to go ahead and effectively change it. Derek Q, this, is, this involves safety of our residents. Just east of here is a quarter that operates heavily emissions and gases. Rose Hill was part of a group, I think, that stopped the building of another dump site. These things emit gases also. You have to regulate all these businesses that are already in our district operating. You have to have tight constraints, and that's where I've been professionals uh, five, five, five years have seen some of the evidence of this. We have to tighten up on them and have them accountable. I-35-410 was a quarter business doing. Yes, on climate change, I um, agree with everything that has been said. It's something that we need to truly study. We need because we see the effects of the climate change in our city, in our state, in our country. And it's something that, with all due respect, that until I see some um, study some inf more information about it, I know what my personal thoughts are. But I cannot interject my personal thoughts into what's best for the district to Thank you. Uh, Rose Hill, got a final question. Uh, uh, <laughs> question for you. Do you want the position permanently? Therefore, will you be, will you want the re-election? Second part of that, do you have any current connections or relationships with the current council members or the mayor? Yes, sir. Yes, I want to permanently know I have no connections. Uh, I'm saying yes to the appointment, and also I have relations with all the council members and the mayor. Yes, 
Yes, I would see prior to the election, and no, I have no connection with the council. Yes, I will be running in the May election, and uh, uh, the council members know me well because I am constantly complaining to them. <laughs> the outrage spending of our money and so on. So, yeah, uh, I have a relationship. Maybe it's not the greatest, uh, but they respect me. Yes, I'll be running, and uh, the only relationship I have is I actually just go to the meetings. I go to the other district meetings, to the community meetings. I want to hear what's happening there. I want to know what's left out in our books, what's left out in our community. That's the best way to do it. Just be an interesting little guest of the other districts. Thank you. Yes, I will be running in May. Uh, I don't have any connection with the council people. I don't know if they know me or not, but I have no connection with them. Does that answer your question? Well, yeah. I'm sorry, one more question. Is anyone, is it just yes, if you are, say yes. Is there anyone serving on any boards that the city has their employment? Yes, I have. Uh, but in order to put your application in, all of us have to resign before they will take your application. So I was on the Joint Commission for Elderly Affairs, and I had to resign. So I am no longer on any boards or commissions. Yes, I was on the committee last month. Which one? The Gold Standard Committee. What? Gold Standard Committee. Oh, Gold Standard Committee. Gary, do you have an affiliation on boards that I serve? I don't have any affiliation with any board. But previously, I served on the zoning commission because a couple of years ago when uh, Sean took the uh, position from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a member of organizations uh, not affiliated with any city government, uh, tier one for the neighborhoods, and I've been asked to be a part of the 2020 plan uh, because actually we're going to go to a second tier. So that's what I'm involved in. I want to know what's happening in our future. It's going to happen now, so we need to vote correctly. Okay, my question to the District 2 uh, panel is when the city gets money and they look at the budget and they have a vote on it, how are you as a district person, council person, or councilwoman going to meet with the associations to make sure that those line items are addressed in our neighborhoods first, our streets, our sidewalks, crime, um, lights, all those important things. Are you, are, you, are you committed to come to the Neighborhood Association and find out what our issues are our first, financially, line item by line item, before our money is distributed to everything like us? That's my question. Absolutely. To be honest, I don't think I have to go to every organization at first. I'm going to look at the I'm going to see for sure why it wasn't given to every neighborhood, every site for the e sign. Then I go to the neighborhood associations to find out why you got it, how you communicate with your district. There, that's the communication I need to research. Thirty seconds. Uh, yes, that's just, just one second. I think the question is uh, is, is uh, so confused here. What I'm talking about is when the city council gives you the money, you know, have that money before you decide as a council person to distribute out into the community that you include the neighborhood association. That's my question. Okay, I think I understand the question. Um, yes, I want the communities to be engaged, and if they're engaged, they should know. In addition to that, anybody, if you want to serve on a commission or a board, if you are involved in a neighborhood association, if I'm your council person, yes, I want to see you appointed to those boards and commissions to be able to report back to what we're doing. Um, I've served with other boards outside of the city um, currently, but to your question specifically, um, I know we already have a bond that's out there. I want to follow up on what that's doing and where that money is and how it's being distributed and any new money that come in. Are expected to be distributed, and I will definitely 
reach out to homeowners association to the community district too and see where they feel the need is after we look at what we already have and where it's going. Rose, now are you specifically talking about the money that is allocated to the individual districts? And then that, and so there are several programs, like there's the neighborhood assistance program. Is that the funds that you're going to be talking about? Okay, uh, my understanding the way that the NAP program works is that if there's an amount under $10,000, these, the council person can direct those funds to an organization. Anything over $10,000, it requires council approval. Derek, can we engage in the school needs that have long been overdue will be met. We have to constantly stay engaged and communicate the needs of this community that have long been neglected. We have to get engaged. We will meet these needs. Like I said before, our neighboring districts are being prosperous right now. We have to catch up. We have to get all these needs met. There's no negotiation for District 2. Thank you. As we end, we want to do two things here. One, the folks, the candidates, the applicants will be around. They do like to talk to any of us individually to get to know them a little better. In these type of forums, it's hard to get everything out there because of time. And then we have so many wonderful candidates, it's hard to get everything done. Panelists, I want to thank y'all so much. I wish we had more time to be more friends. What I do, I think is important, is Sister Gabriella, do you have a burning question? Or do you feel that most of the things you needed to know was answered? I have a burning question. I'll get you in just a second. Go to the panel and come back to you. I think, I do have a burning question, and it's this. When they stand up and embarrassed, stand up, and I'm, I'm not sure you can be like you all are doing that. <laughs> and they say nothing, and they waste our time. I do sure everybody watch the district, I mean, the, the channel 21, the government channel, watch the city council meeting, and I go down to, to uh, uh, excuse me being so loud, I'm like, uh, you know, I go to the D session, and they repeat and repeat and repeat. <coughs> They're not direct. So I ask you, please, no, we're busy people watching that TV, and we want the right answer. I'm sorry, I'm not <laughs> Thank you, Sister Gabrielle. Let me look at the panel. I'm good to you now. I'm good to you. Uh, Joy, is there any burning statement? Who wanted to say a question? But as a leader in this community, is there a burning statement you want to give the applicants in the community here? Well, <clears throat> Well, I appreciate each of you, you know, making yourselves available um, to serve on behalf of your community. But uh, these are very serious times. We have a lot of things that are already in the works that we can't lose ground on. And from some of the questions that were asked today, I think some of you, I'm not sure who's going to end up in it, but there's some, some education that needs to take place because some of the questions were never answered. And we have economic development projects that are going on and that need to happen. And so whatever we can do to help you get abreast of those things, um, please lean on the community and please uh, do your homework because we don't have time to lose. Okay, Joy, you have off of uh, uh, the other Joy, Sister Gabrielle and Joy. Uh, I listen to a lot. There were some, and we, we touched on it, but nobody said the burning thing when the next meeting was. No matter what, you should already know when you're going to sit down with us again. Is it the 14th of February? The 22nd? Assuming that you win, when is your next meeting with all of us? We've been lagging for 18 months. Thanks. Thank you. 
There was another question that came about the uh, Martin King. We know that we're coming up on Martin King marching in. Uh, I've noticed that some things were cut out. Our young people need to stay involved in the Martin Luther King March. We don't need to keep cutting out the bands that march in the, in the, in the uh, Martin Luther King March and everything. So, uh, as our next city council person, There's no question. No, I'm not asking a question. I'm just making a statement. We would like for you to make sure there's nothing else cut out of our Martin Luther King March. It is the biggest, largest march in the nation, and we want to continue it that way. As your former city council, let me tell you what happens. When you get down there, it's easy to lose yourself. We've seen it the last 18 months. People open doors for you. Good morning, council. Good afternoon, council. You lose yourself. You lose sight of why you were there. Don't do that because we'll know. We've seen it the last 18 months. When I was there, and sister's right here, she asked me for an additional $100,000 for private press. Am I right? I called Cheryl Scully, and she said, yes, come see me. No, Cheryl, you come see me. I'm the counselor. Mm -hmm. All right? They need my votes. I don't care. In District 10, what their average home price is, what their median income is, that vote on district, in District 2 counts just as much. You got to know it. You got to act like it. Be strong down there. Like what you hear you say. Sometimes you can't negotiate. You got to know your strength. You know what you went to the table, you don't mind eating alone. You come to the table, because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So you're going to represent us. Get down there and represent us. My question is this at the last meeting, the group said that the council person should not have a job, another job. And I don't know anything about the legal occupations of our That's a great question. That's a great question. We don't need that. Do you have a job in the No, I don't. Do you think you got a job right now? Part time. Okay. Dog? Huh? Okay. Daughter? Yes. Mr. Oh, I'm a business. All right, Mr. Hilliard? Recently retired. All right, the lady here. Yeah, I have um, a statement for you. I live in the area that was formerly <coughs> China Grove. And what I have seen in District 2 is that many times the focus of the city, not necessarily of the District 2 community organizers, but of the city, is that District 2 is comprised of the Near East Side. And my street has had columns and barriers that have been under construction since June. Our bus stops do not have benches, so I can't really take the bus because I can't stand up for 40 minutes waiting for it. So what will you do to energize those district organizations outside of the near east side because we want to help and we want to be a part of this district but we haven't been included. Thank, thank you and that, that is a burning statement. Uh, are you ready to wrap up? What? Yes. Okay, first off I'd like to thank all the candidates for stepping up like this. I know it's not easy. your best to the table because dealing with a whole bunch of different people with a whole bunch of different needs is never a situation. The burning situation that I have is that I hope that once you do and you are ready for this, that you help uh, foster better relationships between the San Diego Police Department and the East Side. We should no longer look like this is the ground. We should no longer look like our young brothers and sisters are just baby moms and a whole bunch of other stuff. We have these we have concerns over here too, so we need them to make sure that they protect and serve us as well. I just want to uh, make sure that uh, the media that's here is appreciated, and I'm hoping <laughs> and appreciate, I appreciate them uh, uh, opening uh, that last meeting as their top story, because that's the only way that we're going to get uh, attention throughout the city.
So I appreciate them being here. Well, we so I, I'm going to be even building today, right? So All right, here's another president right here. Thank you, Attorney Stickerson, fellow San Juan Park. One of the things I think you need to look at is staff recommendations. Once staff recommends things, then you have to go before the planning, the zoning, and ultimately city council. If you don't get the ear of city council before that meeting, it becomes a done deal because they look to the representative of each district in order to determine which way the entire district will go. Thank you, sir. This president, right in the gray sweater. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Surprise, I get to talk. How nice. 30 seconds. I'll make it quick. I think the neighborhood association group that you're trying to put together, Rose, is perfect. We need to have more of that. For the potential city councilman, I feel sorry for you in many ways. <laughs> First of all, the parking down there in that city hall is horrendous for people to come visit and talk to God. Even with an appointment, I have tickets to prove. <laughs> um, but I think this forum is great, and I wish you all luck. Beautiful. Thank you. Any other member presidents? Beautiful. Thank you. Oh, oh. You want me to take it? Please. You had to come. You were bossing me around before. <laughs> I just want to say uh, that it's very important for the councilman to get involved with our community, with the presidents of associations, uh, because since we've been getting working with the community and come the, the district to our crime rate and our street has diminished reduced completely to probably 10%. It is very important that you get involved with that community and sit down and listen. The only thing you have to do is sit down and listen to the concerns of the residents. I don't care how old they are, just sit down and listen to the residents. Can you tell them the name of your uh, association? It's called the Central Office Associations, and I've, I've been a resident of the association for three years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, we want to thank everybody for their participation. We wish we had more time and energy. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you applicants. Now, there's been a statement out there put out there. Is there can there be a decision of people's names to move forward? That's an individual decision. But there is a press conference scheduled for next week, Wednesday, at the City Hall Plaza at 10 a.m. Next week, Wednesday, 10 o'clock at the City Council Plaza to announce those community individuals who want to put forth a specific name. All I will say to each and every one of you, whether you're selected or not, we need your engagement. We need your input. Our community has suffered a long time with people who's angry with one another. We've got to end that. We've got to set that aside. If this if this is not your time, maybe next time we'll be. We need your talent on boards. We need your talent engaged in the community. So we don't want to have people with attitudes because you didn't make this cut. But it is our belief, and y'all tell me if I'm wrong, we've got some potential folks that could be our next year. Uh, so I want each and every one of you to know that. Did an outstanding job. It's just a short time. So, um, just to clarify for the citizens and the constituents, how are we going to get our choices forward to you so that that can roll up on Wednesdays? Or are we all just going to go down there Wednesday and say, I like him, I like her? No, we want a united front. Wednesday needs to be a united front. Absolutely. And so the key to it is emailing, saying what your preference is. If you have a preference, email, and we will take that into consideration. Email text. Okay. So make sure you sign in and we have your email uh, so that we can e-blast it out in terms of what we call the internal vote that's going on. But, Tyrone, are you prepared to get your personal email out there? Sure. 
Okay, so he's been, he's been our reporter since we are a reporter of numbers. You want to tell the people your email? Yeah. Joseph Tower Dart and I live at a from T Y R O N E D A R D E and how do I know? Tyrone Dart at Hotmail.com. We will also email you out. If we got your email on the list, we'll put together a list server and make sure we push it out to you. And if you're interested in participating in that, and there's a majority, we'd like to report that name to the city council as a recommendation. Are we going to that? And y'all can go for yourself too. Okay. Again, thanks to every one of you for being here. I know we went over time, but it was it was valuable. And, and, and thank you to our uh, official sir. And, uh, and you want to say the right word after this word is over. So we I'm going to hold you. I do want to say this. And um, Patrick Jones, back to you here today. I want to say it in 1999. Dr. Thurman Walker started an association called the Community Churches of Social Action. And that organization makes year that I've been in existence for 20 years. Dr. Walker's vision was things of this nature, to get together churches of different denominations. And I take great pride in being a member of the community of churches of social action. The reason is in pastoring right here, right here at this church. We built this this church, this facility 18 years ago. This church was Andy's and Temple. Um, but originally um, that, that was the name of this church. And um, I've been pastoring here for 30 years. And I say that because as a result of the Community of Churches of Social Action. That organization, I would say for about 20 years, I never really knew or engaged with other pastors other than Church of God and Christ pastors. But that organization brought me in the room with pastors from AME churches, Baptist churches, non-denomination churches. And one thing we had in common, we had a passion for the community. And we found that working together, we could do a bigger job. And I appreciate that, that, that to, to be able to be engaged with pastors from other denominations and other faith that were concerned about community. I want to say to in all of these candidates, whatever you do, when you get in that office, you make sure always have CCSA at the table. Because CCSA is an organization that incorporates over 50 pastors in this city that are not just one denomination. And they are concerned about community. And I encourage you, you make sure that we are at the table, that we get a phone call. Whatever you do, make sure CCSA is at the table. Um, Dr. Walker started that organization. Dr. Um, Pastor Herman Price was the second leader of it. And right now, um, Dr. Dill is the, is the chairman. Of, I'm the vice chairman of CCSA. So you remember that organization, Community Churches of Social Action. Whatever you do, you make sure that CCSA knows what you're doing and then we are at the table. All right. Yes. I was the last few weeks that stood in half in my personal report. All right. Vice Chairman of CCSA, so make sure. All right. Thank you. We're standing, everyone. We're standing. I just want to say a prayer before we go. Father, we want to thank you for everyone that's here today. We pray for the community on the east side. Give us wisdom. Give us direction. Order our steps. And I pray for the person that will take on, take on this position. You told us to pray for those that are in leadership. And we pray for them. Lead them and guide them. Give them direction. With you, the glory and praise for in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.